appreciate it. Thank you guys for inviting me to come. I always look forward to talking to Republicans and conservatives. My name is Mr. Weaver. I'm a black conservative with an attitude. I'm going to and, and, and the reason why, I'm going to discuss tonight the reason why. Because I will say, can you hear me? No. Yeah. Turn it up. Oh, I can swear you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to show you how I got to where I am because a lot of people are asking me how to get them to come here, how to get them to understand the truth. Uh, I was raised in St. Louis, Missouri, in the hood. They put me in a slow learning class. Matter of fact, everybody on my block was a slow learner. <laughs> yeah, it's not more money in slow learning. They had a special school, special buildings, special teachers, special budget, and a special class for us slow learners. My mother thought it was strange that I was a slow learner at school, but a fast learner at home. <laughs> and she thought maybe they just were slow teachers at school. <laughs> so she took me out of the school and we moved down to the country where did not have extra money for slow learners. And I was able to finish the fifth grade and ended up graduating a year ahead of my class because I actually was a fast learner. But when I got ready to graduate, I went to my guiding counselor who was a friend of mine. He taught me to shoot at basketball, a friend of mine. And I told him I wanted to graduate a year early as a junior and go to the new junior college they were building. And it was an all-white school, all-white district, and he was aware that black folks had the ambition to go to college. He told me that it was a crazy idea. Why would I want to go to college and take a seat away from more than a white kid? Uh, why don't he let me get a job with other color boys down the shoe factory? He'd be, be my friend. See, it's never personal. It's just personal. It wasn't because of me. It's because I had beaten his son and everything in school. So it didn't bother me. I said, no problem, I'll take care of myself. Went down to the coach. The coach said that he was not going to play me or uh, start me the next season. I was only a black player on the team, which means I never knew how good I really was at basketball. So I decided to quit high school. So I dropped out as a junior, and I joined the Navy the same day that he was murdered, April 4th, 1968. And I went to Vietnam and started my high school graduation. Uh, when I got back from Vietnam, I'm in San Diego, California, on board my ship, working hard, and a known gentleman, and fuck with me further, let me explain something to you. This is not a racial story, this is to have to be my story. There's no guilt. I want you white folks to say, oh, poor Mason, I want to tell me how mean a white guy was. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're Americans, okay? So this is just what happened to me. This white racist one day dropped 2,800 pounds of steel on me, trying to kill me. And I looked at in the eyes, he did it, and hit me on my, on my left hip and knocked me to that steel wall on a Navy ship and broke everything in my body. And my life passed before me. The great doctors at, at the hospital gave me a week to live. Uh, it's been a long week. <laughs> uh, but I was too angry to die. See, that was the last straw for me. This guy that I went to Vietnam with, tried to kill me because he didn't like my attitude as a black man. That was, I mean, how can you trust anybody that looked like him? I, I hated everybody that looked like him. Even though my doctor was white, my physical therapist, I mean, physical therapist was white, uh, the guy to rescue me was white, it did not matter. I now hated every white person on this planet because this one white guy tried to kill me. It was foolish, it was, it, it was, it was inconceived. I got out of the military, Navy retired me, and, and, and I went to Oakland, California with my uncle, and I went to this little college called Merritt College in Oakland. I didn't know it was a founding campus of the Black Panther Party. I didn't know when I took a sociology class by a guy named Melvin Newton, that his older, his younger brother was named Henry Newton, and they liked my voice, I had a strong voice, and attitude. I was older, most of the kids there, and I started hanging out with the Black Panthers. And I took Swahili, I took Black History, and I'm, but I'm also, older than most of these guys, and I, and I graduated from America College, went, went to Berkeley. I had been to Vietnam first. I had seen the world, I saw poverty. I knew racism. I knew that I had conquered everything in front of me, but every day I'm going in pain. I'm going to Berkeley in pain, taking medication. I couldn't sit, I couldn't stand, I couldn't walk. 
and I'm hating. I wanted to kill this guy. My only goal in life was to take this guy's life, to find him and squeeze that look off his face. That's the only goal I had. But I had to start looking. I started noticing something. I started noticing all this hatred. All the folks at Berkeley were saying how tough it was being black. And they were used to white people that had never been black. But they were telling me how tough it was. I mean, one professor said, black history professor, white, blue-eyed German, immigrant, accent, telling me how tough it was being black in America. Not Germany, in America. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So I raised my hand in class. I said, Professor, it's tough being black in America compared to where? Where? What, what nation in Africa can I go to find black folks making as much money? What nation in France, in, in Italy, can I, in Europe, can I go to and see black folks as healthy? What can I go to South America and see black people leading the military? It's better being black in America as it is being German in America. <laughs> because of what we did to America. How can you stay? I said, the, the problem, Professor, is that you are communists. You are communists. You actually hate America. You're here trying to stir up hatred with these black kids under your professorship, and you're telling me to hate my country. And you, I'm just I'm confused because he, he said, how do I know a communist? Because he, he hadn't taught me about a communist world, so it was his job to teach me. I said, well, yeah, actually, I went to Vietnam. I got to meet communists in Vietnam. And there was a difference between a communist in Vietnam and a communist at Berkeley. He said, what's the difference? I said, well, in Vietnam, we got to shoot them. <laughs> he ain't locked me from the top of that. <laughs> See, I was old. I was 25 years old when I got to the Berkeley. These kids were young kids coming from the high school. I went to, I seen the world. And there was a comfort, a comfort in me. I'm going to tell you why it's so hard to reach your liberal friends and relatives. I'm going to tell you why. You give them the law, you give them the truth. You give them the background, you give them the evidence, they still can't get it. I'm going to tell you why they can't get it. So they already know it. If they accept what you're saying, think about this now. If, you're, if your son and daughter accept what you're saying is true, they have to admit they've been fooled all their life. Amen. They've been a sucker all their life. They mean they've been lied to and they brought it. They can't accept it. They can't accept it, folks. They do know it. They do know it. So I took political science because I could not understand the power the parties have to make you vote against your own interests. I couldn't understand. That kind of, I want to learn what kind of power is that. As a Berkeley student, I went searching for who in the heck I was based on my terms, not the group's term, the Black Panthers terms, not nobody's term but mine. I want to know who Mason Weaver was, who was I, and how did I get here? I went looking for how did, how did black people end up on slave ships and come over here? And why are we still serving the slave master? First, first thing I want to tell you folks, start using the proper language. We allow them to change their doggone names. They used to be called Democrats. But they start changing them to Confederates. So now black folks say Confederates fought to keep slaves. No, Democrats fought to keep slaves. Put the name back on it. Put the name back on it. The Civil Rights Movement, every march Reverend King had, every demonstration, every protest, every city, every boycott was against Democrats. How dare you let them call themselves liberals now? Put the name back on them so people can understand what is going on here. Put the name back on them. Juneteenth is coming up now. I cannot wait for Juneteenth. I cannot, I'm going to be in a, in a black church in Pompano Beach. The pastor's inviting me in to say things he's too afraid to say. Bless his heart. I'm going to stand in this black liberal church. I'm going to give them the truth of, of Juneteenth. Do you guys know who you are, Republicans? Do you know who you are? I mean, that's, we got to start telling the truth boldly and aggressively. I'm going to stand at church in June, and I'm going to tell them about Juneteenth. They think that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, and the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free one slave. It wasn't called to be a slave. When Joe Lee got his behind cooked, that freed the slaves. 
And those slave masters took those slaves to Texas, the territory, to start a new country to keep the slaves. Those Democrats in the South took those black slaves to Texas to keep them in captivity. And General Grander, the white general, led the troops into Texas to free the black folk. What they will not tell you, I'm telling them Sunday, what they will not tell you, those troops was 10,000 black ex-slaves that came into Texas as Republicans and marched into Galveston and Houston and said, the game is over. Told those white slave masters, those white Democrats, the game is over. The game is over. Now, now you can imagine the response I'm going to get when I stand in that pulpit and tell them the Democrats kept you behind the slavery and the Republicans freed you. 360,000 white men. I want you guys to think about this. You men, what would it take to get you to take up arms and go and fight your brother to free strangers? What would that take? What moral stand would it take to get you to march up to the next state and destroy your brother's home to free strangers? The Civil War wasn't about power. It wasn't for land. It wasn't for, for increasing captivity. You fought for nothing other than free strangers. Why are we quiet about that? Why are we silent about that? We should be, we should be bragging of what we're doing. We should be standing to the mountaintop. Every problem facing black people is a Democrat problem. Every problem. They own every ghetto in America. Say that loudly. They own every ghetto in America. There is not one thing the Democratic Party has done for black people that we want more of. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> but they changed their names, but they haven't changed the game. They haven't changed who they are. In Tulsa, when Trump was president, I was on this advisory board. We, we formed the Black Boston Trump Advisory Board. I was proud to do it. But boy, they were not aggressive enough for me. They were not aggressive enough. This is, see folks, there's two kind of people in the battle. There are diplomats, and they're warriors. You need both. But warriors, diplomats think that going to battle is negative. They stop talking. They want to talk. You need to talk it sometimes. But warriors feel the battle isn't won until everybody is stop fighting me or they're dead. <laughs> That's a win for the, for the battle. So when we came up on, on the battle, now we, we're in a battle right now, and you got, you got these clowns standing in front of you Proclaiming your children belong to them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're proclaiming in your face. Yeah. Right. You go to school board. I'll tell you the problem with school boards right now. Not enough men. Yeah. Yeah. Not enough men in the school board. Yeah. Yeah. So you ladies too polite. Y'all yeah. too cute. See, y'all want to make peace. I just want to break heads. You, you got my child <laughs> studying what? My child, my, 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 my younger son, bless his heart. I was home. He's in the school one day, he comes home with a survey about my household. A survey. How is your mother overweight? Is your mother overweight? Do you, are you afraid to tell your father you got bad grades? So I wrote, I wrote on the survey, we don't do surveys. Send it back to school. Right? <laughs> Two weeks later, my son had another survey. The teacher said, I'll show you this, Pop. Another survey. I wrote again. We don't do surveys. <laughs> I wrote it in big and less because they're blind. And the third time the survey came to my home, I took the survey to the school. And I walked in the school door. I walked past the principal's office. This me, sir. This me, sir. I kept on walking. Walked to my son's classroom. Opened the door to my classroom. Walked in this class and the blackboard doing some work. He said, excuse me. I said, no, no. That's right. Brian, get up. Let's get out of here. Where are you going? I turned to the teacher and said, I'm going to save you a big grief by not making me come down here the next time and talk about my son. I told you three times, no surveys. I took him out, homeschooling. So the power folks said, we, the men got to show up. They're not afraid of you ladies, they're afraid of us. It's time for us to go to the school board, let us stay home and go to the school board and say, how dare you? How dare you tell my son or daughter anything about sex? Anything, anything about sex. They can't read, they can't write. So I started this little program. I'm trying to find out how to get folks like me to think like me. And it's real simple, folks. It's real simple. You got to make them think. I was in, I was in um, Burger County two weeks ago. 
I'm at this resort, having a great time at the resort, enjoying myself, trying to take some time off to myself. And I go out to the restaurant, to the bar. There was two guys standing, sitting there talking to each other. Two young thugs. Gold teeth, braids, raggedy clothes, kicking back, sitting, sitting back with a joint in their hand at the restaurant. Did not care. As I walked past them, they, they, had, they said something, and I stopped. They talked about business. And I stopped and said, so tell me about what, what you guys doing? This guy was 20 years old, black dude. He had his saggy pants on, big old br braids in his hair, uh, a gold teeth, attitude, smoking a drunk. I found out at 18, he brought a three-wheel motorcycle to cars. And went to the beach, went to the beach and offered it for rent for people to rent for the day. He made some money. He said, well, gee, if I can, if I can make money on one, then buy another one. So he bought another one at 19. And at the beach, he went and saw ready and the people. Now he has a storefront at the beach. He has 21 cars he's written out. And this boy's making money at 20 years old. And so I asked him, I said, so, so you make this money, how much you pay in taxes? He said, like, yeah, man, taxes is high, man. I said, well, how much are you cut your pay in gas? How's the rent down there? He said, high, it's high. I said, man, we gotta do something about that. I said, well, name one thing that Joe Biden's done that you want more of. <laughs> As a businessman, just name one thing that I want to, but Trump is a racist. Okay, he's a racist. Name one thing that Trump did that you want less of. The simple as that. It's a simple, ask your name, ask your family to name one thing that a Democrat has done that you want more of. Make them answer that question. The book, the Democratic Party Hates America. The Democratic Party Hates America. Give this book to your relatives and you ask them a question. You ask them a simple question. I heard this black man speak. Now they got their attention. They think you're a racist, right? So now they got their attention. You heard a black man speaking. Gee, what's wrong, Grandma? I got, got you going on, huh? And you say, I got this book and I'm confused. They think you're confused anyway, right? They think you're confused. So now they think, my, my Grandpa's got it. He got it turning. He's turning now. So can you read this book for me and tell me where he's wrong? Not if you like him, not how you feel. Not if you, see, they call you a name, folks, but they've never called you a liar. Notice that? You tell them what you want, you tell them the truth, the facts, the history, and they will never call you a liar. They call you racist and hateful and phobic and all that stuff. They can't be there to get you to stop talking about what you're talking about and start defending yourself. Be a liar. They'll never call you that. So as a young man, I'm studying black history. I want to find out. I, I want to know the truth. How did black folks get here in chains? And how they got unfree in chains? When I discovered, first off, we got here because we were not worshiping God. Amen. You will never see in the history of mankind, you will never find in the history of mankind, the people going into captivity while they're worshiping God. And you will never see an example of them coming out of captivity until they start worshiping God. Amen. I found that out. So I'm watching, they, they come over here on slave ships worshiping all kinds of false gods. And they get here and they stay in captivity until they start singing those Negro spirituals in the field. And then the Western church and the Quaker church are stirring. And then minister Harry the Stone get a girl her title, and Reverend John Brown, and the Christian movements began in the South, the safe houses began, and those slaves marched out singing God's praises, and then the white folks up North that couldn't end slavery. See, you Republicans became Republicans because you got tired, you got, you're a tired old party, you're tired, you got tired of compromising. You got tired of compromising with slaves, stayed in the free state, and you said, you know what, America, if you give us control of this government, we're going to end slavery. In 1854, your first platform was nine planks long. And six of those planks said, we're going to end slavery. We're not going to compromise anymore with Democrats. We're not going to have one slave state, one free state. We're tired of the Missouri Compromise. We're tired of the Cassidy Brasco Act. We're tired. We're tired. 
And when you stood up boldly, they called you radical Republicans back then. God bless you. Because when you stood up on America, people said, we are done with this stuff. You're done, America. And America gave you total power in this country. They gave the majority of house, state houses, majority of state senates, the majority of, majority of governorships. They gave you the Congress, the Senate, and the White House. And that's why the Democrats had to leave this country to keep their slave. They knew that once Congress met, it was going to be over. And then it wasn't enough. They left the country, and it wasn't enough. Because you, Thai Republicans, said, even if you form another nation, you're not going to be on this continent. We're going to stop slavery. And you pursued them to their homes. And 360,000 white men died fighting their brothers and free strangers, folks. The Civil War, you want to call it a Civil War, I call it a Crusade, number one. It wasn't a Civil War. You have never seen a Civil War where people fought for a third person. You have never seen that. But the death, the our Civil War was the most, the most casualties than any war we ever, ever had. Before Vietnam, it was every war combined wasn't enough to match what happened in the Civil War. The biggest slaughter in our country's history to change that wrong to a right. And then we came up, Republicans went and fought Democrats, and Democrats lost the country, they lost the war, and they came back and we forgave them. We should have banned them. Yeah. We should have banned them. I mean, think about it, folks. What they, today, they hate God, they hate freedom, they hate, your, they hate your constitution, they hate your children, they hate prosperity, they hate your life, they hate everything you love. Why not ban these clowns? The most terrorist group in the world, Democratic Party, why not ban them? Let's stop playing. The Civil War is not over. They've never surrendered. They've never surrendered. They want to control, and they came back into our country, and they've been picking at us and picking at us and picking at us ever since. We gotta stand up boldly and tell these clowns the game is over, like those black troops did in Galveston. They marched into Galveston, he like ex-slaves, picking up guns, and said, we can fight, and watch in the Galveston, Texas, and free their own brothers and sisters. That's, folks, is America. Yeah. So what we have here, Republican Party, I'll tell you who you guys are. You're the greatest party this planet has ever seen. Yes. What you guys have done what you guys stand for, you should be proud and loud. You got to be proud and loud. Because once you're bold, every time we're bold, every time we're bold, we win. Donald Trump was bold. We won. Every time we're bold, boldness wins. Everybody you know in history, everybody you know in history, you know because they were bold. You don't know what color in history. Good and bad, you're bold. We have to be bold. Now, we also got to go and get those votes. They're easy to get. I can burn Democrats every, every day. I have a, 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 a Trump hat on that I wear looking for folks. We can be weird. <laughs> Just a conversation. Can I help you? Ask you a question for you? Something on your mind? And make them say it. Make them say it. What, what black man is Republican? A free one. <laughs> Let me tell you about it. Let me tell you about it. Let me. Have you heard about freedom? Have you heard about freedom? Right. Gee, I'm at Berkeley, and everybody's telling me at Berkeley how the white man got you down. White man got you down, Mason. White man got you down. I was saying, how did I get to Berkeley? We were at Berkeley, and we didn't get scholarships. We are competing at Berkeley. What do you mean? How did the, how did the white man, I mean, that whole concept got me wrong. I'm saying, I'm thinking, okay, the white man got me down, how did Jack Johnson live in Mississippi, Alabama, knocking out white men, American white women, become the heavyweight champion of the world? Yeah. How did that happen? How did Charlie Pride in Mississippi, yeah. you hear me? Yeah. In Mississippi, how did Charlie Pride become the country worst singer of the decade? Yeah. How did that happen? How did Oprah become Oprah? How did Jesse Jackson become Jesse Jackson? I mean, I had a, during the campaign, I ran ads. I, I spent $30,000 on my grandkids' inheritance <laughs> <laughs> to, run, to run ads in Chicago and Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago, Detroit. 
answer the question. Anytime Steve Harvey went for a break on his radio program, my ass popped up. I, I brought all the ads after his, his opening statement. Every ad in that show. He, he would make a comment, and I might add a pop up. Why would any black person vote Democrat? Gee, I just asked a question, pop, pop, pop. And one day his, uh, his staff called me. He went to interview me. He never did, though. Look <laughs> at my response. My response to the staff was real simple. You asked Steve Harvey how he became Steve Harvey. Yeah. What government program made him Steve Harvey? Mm. What, what social program made him great? I heard his testimony. He was broke as the Ten Commandments. Didn't have enough money to fly to New York for the, for the Apollo show they invited him to. Eating, eating chicken, staying in the dark and taking five chicken place. I saw him hard work. I said, Steve, go in there and tell folks, hard work always works. Yes. Hard work, not government programs that hand out cheese. Yes. Government work comes from hard work successful. Yes. So here I am, high school dropout, disabled, angry, mean as a snake. I mean, I broke up with a girl because she had a white dog. <laughs> I did. She was beautiful too. She was fine. I broke up with her. I'm, I'm, I'm mean, but I started to learn. I started to learn. So if the white man got me down, why go to school? Why could try, try to get a job? Why be decent? Why man got you down? So I finally realized it wasn't the white man that me down. It was Democrats that had me down. Yeah. Yeah. Once I realized the difference, folks, once I realized the difference, I got angry and embarrassed. They, if they admit it, they have to be embarrassed. I've been fooled, hoodwinked, I've been lied to and misused, and I, I, I got angry. Overnight, I changed. Overnight, on a freeway drive from San Diego to Oakland, overnight, I was changed, and I was healed, by the way, because I thought of that hatred was heavier than 2,800 pounds of steel. The hatred kept me down. The hate me kept me bent over. The hate me, the hatred kept me limping around. And I forgave that white boy because God forgave me all my sins. Amen. I forgave that white guy. I haven't seen him since, but I forgave him. And when I forgave him, I was healed. All, all the anger left. And now I can compete in America. And I went home to my living girlfriend, their grandma, that I've been married to for 45 years, since she, I mean 35 years since she died. I went home to her and told her, you got to change your last name or change your address. God don't give grown men girlfriends. <laughs> and I became a man. I became a male. That means that everything around me is my control. But just something wrong, it's me that I stand up for it. You want to reach the black community out here, folks? Show up. The problem we have is showing up. Do we got to understand guerrilla warfare? They support their guerrillas. They fund their guerrillas. They give a half billion dollars to the NWCP every year to go out and start up trouble. You hear now, the, the Florida is a, is a, a warning, tra travel warning? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. yes. If you believe that boys should have babies, it's a place you're not supposed to be. I got you. <laughs> I got you. But they have, they have got us so divided by our differences we cannot function. So what happens, you have to fund the guerrillas. Plan Parenthood, 600 million bucks a year they give them. They, they got the, the, the program to, to increase your, 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 your uh, freeways and highways. They're just union jobs to give them more donations. We don't do that. We don't do that because we're diplomats. We think the reasoning works. They know the truth. Democrats know the truth. Let's change the title, change the names. You tell black folks, my fact, I mentioned Trump, Trump. Trump had a speech plan in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Happened to be on Juneteenth. And Democrats went crazy. How dare you speak in Tulsa with those white folks who struggle with that black community? Yeah, Democrats can you struggle with the black community. And I called the campaign and said, would you please let me go and speak before Trump? Let me go to Tulsa. To Tulsa. That was the, the first time in history that airplanes were used to bomb civilians. Where Democrats bombed the black community in Tulsa. Let me go and speak. Let me stand up in the pulpit and talk about what happened in Tulsa when Democrats destroyed the black enterprise. See, the problem with Tulsa was that black folks didn't give them have a political power. They had the financial power. And then Juneteenth, you're going you're gonna to criticize for Juneteenth? Let me tell you about Juneteenth and start preaching the gospel. 
You got to, got to, to have the guerrilla warriors, the, the, the young people, the black folks, Italian people. In Miami, there, there's been a rally in Miami with 50,000 Spanish people. Yes. And I know the guy, the guy that does it up here, as a matter of fact. <laughs> on his own, out of his own pocket. Come on, folks. Eisenhower managed to assemble the biggest army ever. Artillery, ever. Biggest number of ships, ever. But he still need the French underground to bomb them bridges and destroy the, the supply chain and the spy. You need the warriors out here doing this. This next election, every time we show up, folks, we win a landslide. This next election, you get 10% of the black vote. Now, I know you people think that 95% of the black folks vote Democrats. That's a lie. The polls come from inner city ghettos. <laughs> Seven, under Donald Trump, 72% of black people became middle class, folks. I got news for you. We paying gas prices too. We, we pay the price of chicken also. <laughs> Trying to get our kids in school. You know, we got the same problems and the same solution. Republican president. That's the solution to the problems. If you put us out there in front, we have the Republican Party was invited to the NWCP here at, after Martin Luther King Day Parade, and we went. They made the mistake of inviting Republicans, and Republicans made the, the crucial error of inviting me. <laughs> so I went with the Republican Party, and we had a great old time talking about Democrats, not liberals. Democrats, not, you know, when I told those black folks that the, the, the march, they were just talking about a, um, John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, bragging about how great he was. And I said, John Lewis, that's the guy that marched on the Pepper's Bridge? Yeah, yeah, man, got beat up by the dogs and, and got ticked, uh, ticked ass on him and, and the sheriff stood in front of him and, and pushed him back. And yeah, 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 he got up and joined them. They were Democrats. He got up and dished himself off and joined the Democrat Party, became rich. He had a $10 million paint in his house when he died. But the people of Baltimore were broke and poor and enraged. So you, you could support this. They almost threw me out their place. Let us show up, folks. Every time we get 10% of the black vote, we have a landslide. And it's easy to get now. Easy to get now. So I'm encouraging you. We got three books to sell out there. My first book is It's Okay to Leave the Plantation. It, it's, the master won't tell you to leave it. Freedom is over, slavery is done. The second book is Tribalism. The tribalism book is my first novel. I talk about, I, I take a black teenage gang member. He dies in a shootout. He wakes up 150 years in the past on a plantation as a slave. And he still remembers the future, his freedom he had and everything else. So now you got this black kid on the plantation, still nobody cared for him and nobody around him believed him. You mean you were free and y'all still shoot each other? You, you were free and you can't. That he, he meets, he learns to respect black women when he meets Harry Tubman and gets free. He learns to respect white people when he sees who run the safe houses. He gets free up north and meets Frederick Douglass, who tells him, he said, I'm so glad to be free. I'm so glad to be free. And Douglass tells him no one is free, and that's all of us are free. So this young man has to go back to that plantation to free his mother and his girlfriend. And that's the story. It, 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 it's riveting to read it. The last book is The Democratic Party Hates America. It's just me outlining everything they hate, which is everything you love. Also, finally, for you guilty white people, <laughs> you all know who you are. Yeah, who are. Juneteenth is coming. That's what all white folks feel guilty about your great great grandfather, did my great great grandfather. And since it's my debt, they want re reparations, I'm going to give you each a certificate of forgiveness. Oh <laughs> <laughs> okay? So, my my grandmother has to come back there for you, yes. And tell to your friends, and they will be astounded and hateful. I forgive for all, all the problems that the black community have been done on you, so we are free. We're going to act like we're free. God bless you. Thank you very much.